Now, I want to say one more word about uh, the Christian faith <clears throat> being received within a culture and the transformations that take place within that culture as the Christian faith is received. Remember, we said that when someone, we, we talked about these two circles. This is my circle. This is the other person's circle. When I become a Christian, it means that I invite Christ into the center of my circle. But it does not mean that I need to leave my culture and enter into another culture migrating like that. No, that's not what it means to be a Christian. What it means is to receive Christ into my culture where he begins to bring about a transformation within. Um, and that's what I experienced in, in Tanzania among the Zanaki people as I was growing up. I observed that they were not abandoning their, their uh, Zanaki culture to join another Western culture. They weren't doing that, no. They were remaining Zanaki, but within their culture. And in that way, they were bringing transformation into their culture, within the culture, but not as migrants into another culture. To illustrate what I'm talking about, uh, I talked a little bit about the Maasai yesterday and so forth. I want today to tell about um, a, a, a family among the Zanaki who illustrate what I'm saying in a very, a very helpful way, I think. His name was Nyakitumo, which I put on the board, and her name was Wakuru. First of all, Wakuru. When she was about 12, she came to our home and she said she wants to follow Jesus, just that simply. And so my parents introduced her to the Christian faith. There was a couple other young girls also who were committing their lives to Jesus at that time. So they were the very first believers among the Zanaki. Uh, so they were pioneers of the Christian faith within that culture. About that time, Wakuru learned that her father had planned for her to marry an old man who already had many wives. And she was very dismayed about that. She asked my parents what she should do. The missionary can, cannot answer that question. The person themselves themself needs to know how they'll respond to this sort of, of challenge. You see, within the Zanaki culture, it operated like a hierarchy. And the father is at the top of the hierarchy. And so what he, what he said to his children had to be obeyed. Power came from the father downward, you see. So if father had determined that Wakudu must marry this old man, then there was no alternative. She had to accept that because he had the authority to say that. Her responsibility was to obey her father. His responsibility was to instruct her on what she should do. He not only had arranged for her to marry this old man, but he had also received the cows necessary for the dowry. So the cows had already been exchanged. She didn't know about this, but she learned that that's what had happened. And so she meets with my parents to for counsel and to pray and so forth. And she decided that she will inform her father that she has decided not to marry that man, respectfully decided not to marry him. Now, never before in the Zanaki tribe had such a thing happened, where a 12-year-old girl felt empowered to say to her father, I will not marry that man. Because everything in the culture said the father had that authority, he was above her in the power hierarchy, when he said that she had to marry this man, it had to be so. There was no way out. Even today, 70 years later, when I go to East Africa and I talk to Africans about this event that took place, and I say the father had already received the cows, they say, oh, 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 oh. Then there was no way out. She had to marry him. But she simply said, I won't. I will not marry that man. 
God has a better plan for me. Because in Jesus, I have learned that God loves me. And if God loves me, I know his plan is not for me to marry that old man with many wives. And so her parents beat her. They chained her with uh, great big brass bracelets and locked them on each of her feet and between so that when she would walk, she had to hobble, you know, just tiny little steps like that. She uh, could not run away. Um, they threatened her life. Um, then sometimes they would think that perhaps she's learned her lesson and so they would take these bracelets off of her and as soon as she could, she would run away and again come to our house. I remember on one occasion, she, on one occasion as she was running, the men in the clan started to chase her. She outran them, ran into our house and hid under the bed where my brother and I uh, slept stayed there all day long. We found her at the end of the day shaking like a leaf. My mother took her in her arms, prayed for her, uh, embraced her, assured her that God loves her. It was a very, very difficult time. It seemed that someone might even get killed in the conflict because the whole tribe was shaken to its foundations because never before had such a thing happened where a 12-year-old girl felt empowered to say to her father and mother, I have decided not to marry the man that you have determined I should marry. Um, it, was, uh, it was a tremendous revolution taking place, and it was empowered by Christ. Wakudu simply said, Jesus loves me, and I know Jesus would not want me to marry that man. So finally, the parents um, gave up, gave up the battle. Uh, what to do? I mean, you can't, you can beat someone, you can imprison them and so forth, but at the end of the day, people are free. And so they, uh, they, uh, they finally uh, backed up, said, we do not bless your decision, but obviously we cannot force you short of death, and they weren't going to do that. Then, sometime later, oh, the other thing, the other thing that happened was that she also said to her parents, she will not submit to female circumcision, which was required of all 13, 14 year old girls in the whole tribe. That practice was very much linked up to the uh, veneration of the ancestors, that uh, the blood of the circumcision uh, mingled with the ancestors in the ground, linking the living with the dead. It was a powerful bonding between the ancestral spirits and the spirits of the living people. Uh, so it wasn't just an individual factor, it was a whole tribal factor built into this. But again, respectfully but firmly, she said to her parents, I would not submit to that. Jesus has come to free me from the power of the ancestors, from the occultic powers that you were talking about. He has freed me from all of that, and he frees me from this practice, which is so very, very cruel. I will not submit to it. And um, again, the whole tribe was profoundly shaken, for she was the first young girl who had stood up to this practice. Um, a very challenging journey she was on in every way. It's interesting that when we were at Bumangi last uh, summer, that Wakuru's children made a point to come to meet with us and these great-grandchildren of, of, um, of my parents. They wanted to meet with them. And this was one thing they wanted our grandchildren to know, that our mother was the first, the very first in the tribe to break loose from this practice, uh, which, uh, which all women were expected to submit to. They felt it was very important that our children realize how very powerfully revolutionary that was. And they said as Jesus just reached down and took our mother's hand and lifted her up and freed her from all of those practices. In due course, Nyakitumu asked for her hand in marriage, and he now was one of the very first Christian young men in the whole tribe, if not the first Christian man. And she was delighted. She said, absolutely, she would be delighted to marry him. Um, fine Christian young man, and so he goes across the hill over to Wakuru's home and met with her parents and said, Wakuru and I would like to get married. And they said, that can't be. 
you can't get married. You know that because you are of the blacksmith clan and Wakuru was of the basket maker clan. That tribe was divided into two clans, the basket makers and the blacksmiths. And uh, uh, they had a taboo within the culture that these two clans could not intermarry, impossible. It was a prohibition that ran more deeply than any racism you could consider. It was taboo. The ancestral spirits forbade it. They would not permit it. And so they said, Naki Tubo, are you, are you crazy? You know that it's a Naki. It's impossible for a basket maker and a blacksmith to get married. It's rooted in our ancestral spirits and their will for us and their expectations for us. And there's a taboo against it. It is absolutely impossible. You cannot do that. What do you do? What do you do? They believed that God wanted them to get married. They loved each other. They, were a, they wanted to establish a Christian home. But the, ancest, but the, but the uh, elders of the clan and the parents absolutely forbade it because it was so counter to the culture. Well, they said to the parents and to the elders of the clan, but we are Christians. And in Jesus, there is one new humanity. And so we can marry cross these barriers. These barriers cannot separate us. Jesus has come to free us from this sort of thing. There is no taboo about who you can marry and who you can't marry in Christ. We're all one new creation in Christ. And so they tried to preach the gospel to them uh, and, and communicate to them the freedom that they have in Christ. But the tribal elders were absolutely adamant. However, the church, it was a small church just beginning to develop, just a few believers. The church would meet regularly and pray for this couple, that God would show the way. And so Nyaki Tumu persisted. And you know, again and again, he'd walk across the valley over to the home of Wakuru and sit with her parents and talk and beseech them to please change their minds. They did not want to get married against the uh, command of their parents. They so much wanted the parents to change their mind about this. And finally, after many, many months, the parents said, well, we will accept this. It's not our will to accept it, but what can we do? You are so persistent. And so we won't bless your wedding, we won't bless your marriage, but we will not block it. And so they were given the uh, permissive will, but not the voluntary will of their parents. And so Nyakuru and Nyakitumu had the first Christian wedding among the Zanaki people, the first Christian wedding in our little church that was developing. But the tribal elders cursed them. Although the parents had permitted them to get married, not so the tribal elders. The elders of the tribe cursed them so that they would die and so that they would, I'm sorry, not die, so that they would have no children. They cursed them so that they would have no children. And so the first Christian wedding in the Zanaki land was a wedding cursed by the, by the fathers and mothers of the clan. And then guess what happened? God blessed them with 13 children. <laughs> 13 children. <laughs> it was wonderful. And the, the whole tribe says, wow, God is blessing these Christians with children like flocks of goats because children are considered a great blessing from God. And although we curse them so they could have no children, they're multiplying like flocks of goats. And the, the whole tribe was tremendously impressed that the curse was broken. Their youngest daughter, um, what had a severe attack of malaria when she was a baby, and it created cerebral palsy. And so she became a handicapped girl, seriously handicapped. And she lived till she was something like 21 years of age. She became a very big woman, very large woman, and that was an enormous challenge to the family to care for her. Um, but they loved her so much, and they cared for her so generously. Now, in the traditional culture, they would have just put someone like that out into the bush, you know, to be dealt with by the, uh, by the hyenas. But not so, not so this couple. They cared for that daughter so lovingly and so tenderly. And that became a witness also to the whole tribe 
that Jesus loves even the handicapped. He cares for them. And they express the love and care of Jesus for that handicapped daughter in very, very generous ways. When she died, I got a letter from Yakitumo, and he said, uh, last night our daughter went to be with the Lord. And as she was laying in bed, all at once she cried out with great joy, Oh, Father, and oh, Mother, I see them coming. The angels are coming from me. Goodbye, you know, and she was gone. She went to be with the Lord. Uh, they became the pastor couple, actually, who took the place of my father and mother there among the Zanaki. Um, and for years, they served very fruitfully, and that one church became many churches. Some Last time I was out there, they were saying there were some 30 churches in the region that were multiplied in extension out from that church at Bumangi, where I grew up. And then my father uh, died and my mother were gone. Uh, so I would keep in touch by letters with this family occasionally because this couple were very close to my parents over the years. And so we'd have maybe once a year an exchange of letters. And one day I got a letter from Yakitum, a long letter, written in Swahili, of course. David, guess what happened? <laughs> we just had our 50th wedding anniversary. Now this was the first time ever in the history of that tribe that anyone had had a 50th wedding anniversary. Why? In polygamous societies, you never have wedding anniversaries, you see. You just don't have it. But here was this couple, one husband, one wife, faithful to each other for 50 years. It was absolutely unprecedented. Never before had any such a thing ever happened in the culture. And so they had this great wedding anniversary, 50th anniversary. I think they said that three bishops came and 24 pastors came and the church was packed out with 700 people and the choirs sang and more choirs sang. And he said, and our children got a new suit from me and a nice new dress for my wife. And we were dressed in the finest, you know. And as we walked from our house to the church, the choirs lining the walkway all the way to the church. And then the preaching and the rejoicing by the tribal elders that this family had been faithful to one another, loving one another all these years, the first time ever that a couple had been married for 50 years in a monogamous relationship in the history of that tribe. It was a tremendous celebration. And they killed a huge bull and had a great feast with all the guests coming. A tremendous celebration. Even the chief, I think he says, was there and gave a speech about this family being a model of what joyous family living should really be all about. I wasn't there for that ceremony, but shortly thereafter, I did visit. I get to East Africa quite often, and I always try to make a point, if I can, to get to Bumangi, where I grew up. Most of the early Christians are now in heaven. They're not with us anymore, uh, but... Uh, but uh, they are remembered, and so I go back to visit that, that church. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. Uh, the joy just permeates that whole society, the, uh, the transformational joy of what this family represented, of a husband and a wife loving one another, being faithful to one another, only ever having one companion, the joy and the wonder of it all. Um, on that visit, my, my visit shortly after that wedding anniversary, why uh, this Wakuru said about her husband, Yakitumo, David, you know what? I lived with him for 50 years, and he just loved me. <laughs> he never beat me even one time. <laughs> what? To live with a wife for 50 years and never ever beat her? I mean, that is pretty revolutionary stuff, isn't it? <laughs> she said, he just loved me. He never ever beat me. So it was an amazing celebration indeed. Yeah. And so that's just a little window, you see. They never left their tribal culture. They were always the Naki. The songs that were sung at their 50th wedding, 50th wedding anniversary were the Naki songs, you see. 
they were songs written by the youth and the choirs and so forth for the occasion, singing in Zanaki. The dances that went on at that celebration gathering were Zanaki dances. The killing of the bull and the eating of the, uh, of the uh, uh, and feasting together was done in a Zanaki way, you see. The church service was conducted in a Zanaki way. They were truly, truly within the culture. They never left it, but they revolutionized the culture. From that day until today, 12-year-old girls know that they can say no to dad. He doesn't have the last word on who they will marry. Where does that empowerment come from? It originated from a couple, Nyakuru, Iwakuru, and Yakitumo, who said, we're going to follow Jesus. And Jesus reaches down and he rescues us from those practices which are destructive to full um, joyous, abundant living. He wants to free us from that, bring new life, transform us. That's what he's about. And that means we become a community, a witness for transformation within our culture.